All right, good to see you. Welcome back. We're carving with Eric here. I wanted to show you this because I, I picked this carving up at an estate sale some time ago. Really, really was fascinated by it. Not, not only because of the subject matter, but by the way it was done. This is very, very, very flat plane. And so I wanted to adjust the camera up a little bit. I wanted to do one of these and it's been sitting in my shelf for a while and then back in the COVID days I decided well why don't I do a few the the problem I run into with this is it's small and I don't really like doing small faces for me when I do a face I want it larger than my thumb you can see the thumbnail I got. This face isn't much larger. It's, it's probably, what is it, about an inch all, all, all told. But if you go from the chin up to the headband, we're talking three quarters of an inch. It's a small carving that I don't really enjoy doing small carving. So I've done a few of these and I decided I wanted to have a little fun with them. Let me pull some of these out. Let's start, I'll start off first with the pattern. I got a pattern. This comes out of a 2x2x5 two by two by carving. And I've got a front pattern and I've got a side pattern. <laughs> my wife makes fun of me because I'm, I'm very frugal and I use cereal boxes as part of my as part of my patterns because they're I'm recycling and I don't like to throw anything away. So that's on the back of a cereal box. If you see me teaching somewhere and I pull out a pattern Please don't make fun of me because I've made them into out of, out of cereal box. But anyway, it's two by two by five inches tall. I guess you could scale that up to six inches tall or down to four inches tall. That's entirely up to you how you want to do it. But I've done these out of this. This comes out of a two by two by five. And when I cut them out on the bandsaw, that's what it looks like. And so looking at how it, how it matches up, I've got all the major features there, all the gross anatomy, as Harley Ripsall says in his classes. And you get an idea of where that's at. So easy enough to do that pattern, the, the front and back pattern, because I leave the back flat. And easy enough to do the, the side pattern. Fair enough. So I've done a few of these because I had some issues with this, not because of the way it was carved, but because of the way that I do it. And so, let me, let me talk about some of the issues. One of them is getting the hand and the foot to line up to the point where you can drill a hole through there for the, for the rifle or whatever accoutrement you want to put into the hands. And so I've done a few of these and getting that to line up and getting the hole to be the right size is, is a little bit difficult. And so my versions of these look somewhat like this. I think here was the can't remember if that's the first one I did and you can see my heads are bigger I made that one small and then as they got as, as I did more of them I made the heads larger simply because I wanted to add more features I don't want to dishonor my Native American brothers and sisters by carving something that was too cartoonish but I wanted to make something that that would honor that carving and would honor those of us who are those in our audience who have Native American blood. So I'm going to lay these up here and I want to talk about a couple of things. When I when I do this guy and I and I really like the way it was done. I like the flat plane aspect. I like the very minimal minimal coloring and very minimal embellishments to the head but my, my biggest problem is right here this is the skull cap all of this is mounted to a, a piece that mounts on their head and I'll show you that in a little bit but where the feathers come out I want to I'll show you some pictures and the, where the train comes down this it, this caused me problems getting here because while that feather starts up here and goes there if that's all that you have that's fine but if a lot of headdresses have a few more coming back here and it makes it problematic to do, to do this and to fit that to the head because if you project that where that where that round piece goes 
that should be a little bit bigger at the back of the head because that's what sits on the skull and, and, and all the feathers and all the headbands and all the other embellishments mount to that. But I really enjoy the flat plane aspect of it because you don't expect it to be realistic looking fingers. You don't expect all the, not sure why they put all these little wrinkle marks in here, but I, I enjoy this one and I think it came out really well. Let me show you, I did some research and, and I've learned from some other carvers and I want to mention Lynn Dowdy primarily. When Lynn does a carving, you really get impressed by the amount of research that he did. So I've, I've got several books that I use for research that I really enjoy using and I found some things that will help me navigate through the issues that I have on this. And so let me flip open some pages here. Here's the first one. And this is a really neat book. There's some really good stuff in here. Native American portraits are several of them done by several different authors. Text by Nancy Hathaway. And all of these have pictures of who took them. And so if we look at this first one right here, we see how it's got a headband. It's got embellishments here with feathers or pieces of fur or trim or whatever. But the headbands lay back. or the, Sorry, the feathers lay back. And as you get back here to the to the back of the body, you have to worry about gravity. Well, gravity's going to pull these down. And so this is a portrait of an uh, eagle who was a Sioux chief. Here's another one. Uh, skip pages. Hang on. Here's another one where the, tra the, the trailing headdress comes all the way down the back of the body. We're not going to get that. We're not going to get that detailed on this one, but we are going to look at some of these so that we know what ours is going to look like. Because you have a lot of opportunity in this one to get as many embellishments, and we'll, I'll show you some beadwork examples here in a little bit. But add the little trailing pieces off of, off the feathers. So there's opportunity here to really get. As Bob Ross says, let's get crazy. So you can get a little bit crazy on some of these. I'm having trouble turning pages to the end. I don't know why, but anyway. Here's two of them side by side. So you see how this one sticks up rather than lays back. And then they, they kind of fan out as they come around same way with with this one here they come back and then you see all of them laying down here and they fall according to gravity so that's one piece of research that i used here's another one american indian portraits from the wanamaker expedition of 1913. And I, didn't, I didn't pay much money for it we have a our local library has a friends of the library group and they sell extra copies of things that they don't want or they, things that aren't being used checked out and so I every year I go down and I seem to, seem to end up with more than I've donated. When we do the headband you can see how the embellishments here with the beadwork and the bells or the little metal embellishments there just add to that and if that's what someone wants to do you've got a lot of opportunity here to add all kinds of beadwork all kinds of, I wish I knew the names of all these things, but I don't, and I should have before I, before I did all that. But there are a lot of ways in which you can individualize your carving. These look like pieces of fur hanging off here, and it looks fairly well detailed in terms of the beading and then how the feathers are tied with, with the fluffies, how that's all tied to the, head, to the headband. And so it's, it isn't just photographs that you can use. Here's a, a drawing book, The Mystic Warriors of the Plains by Thomas Mails. And so when you go through here, there's, a, there's paintings and there's drawings. Here's one that I like because I got a good side view of it as I did my research. This one right here, you see how the headbands come back and how the feathers, not headbands, sorry, the feathers fall back here. And there's several of them in this book that I wanted to draw your attention to. I, I, I'm not advocating going out and spending a lot of money on books. A lot of this stuff you can find off the internet if you know what your search parameters are. And so you can get a lot of these images without having to take up bookshelf space and, and without spending money. 
see how the terrain falls back here and it looks like they've added more embellishments and I'm not sure what that what that is looks like there might be some hides hanging off of there another example this long one I don't advocate you do that at least starting off because that is a uh, as my friend Steve says that's real futsy to sit here and do all those feathers when you get the impression with just a small headdress but I'm not telling you not to do that. I'd, I'd love to see somebody take that on and really have a little bit of fun with that because it looks like it'd be a lot of fun. Here's another picture of, of the side and back view. And so if this is the head up here, that feather will fall down here and you've got them sticking straight up and then they kind of come down at the back. This book is chock full of all kinds of drawings where somebody has done a lot of work on it. Not sure why I flipped open to that page. I had it bookmarked, but I don't know why. Here's another one. Look at that fancy train as it comes down. It, I've seen them come down straight. I haven't seen one in my view. I haven't seen one that comes down like this, but I really like that, that extra detail there. For those of you that don't want to do headbands or don't want to do feathers, there's buffalo skulls. And there's the, I think this is called a roach. But anyway, it gives you an idea of, of different ways of doing this. For those of you that like headdress made of a bear or a wolf, um, others like that, there's a lot of ways that you can individualize this. And I've done a lot of Native American Boy Scout carvings where bolo ties and neckerchiefs where I've, I've used some of these ideas. Here's one of a buffalo hair headdress. But today we're talking about feathers. And so when we look at feathers, you get a picture, a drawing, a painting of the way they look. And that's what we're gonna try to follow on our path, on our path today. One more picture out of this book because I want you also to understand, and this is, this is something I learned in, in looking through this, different foot patterns of the Native Americans and how they would do their, their moccasins, but also how their head, headdresses stood up. This one has the Blackfoot has a feather sticking up, the Sioux has them kind of back, and then the Crow lays them a little bit more flat. So just something to think about if you want to be authentic, even if it is a caricature, you still got to follow some kind of realistic way of doing it. This is a neat little book, The Technique of North American Indian Beadwork. I like it a lot. And again, I paid a dollar for it. And in it, there's all kinds of pictures and diagrams of different beading techniques and different beading examples. And so there's a lot of things in here to get inspiration from. And it actually has a few colorized pictures in here as well. But for those of you that, that, that like me, that brainstorm ideas for doing beadwork, whether it's on the moccasins, whether it's on the leggings, whether it's on the shirt, sometimes you just run out of ideas and you look at the internet and it isn't enough. So this might help you a little bit as well. Check it out from the library if you've got one, take pictures buy a copy i paid a dollar for it it's well worth it, the dollar that i would pay on it so anyway just some give you some ideas of, of things to add when you go to do your carving so this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to want to going to start with so i've cut it out on the bandsaw according to the patterns i've got my patterns here i'm going to leave those there for just a few seconds for those of you that want to do a screenshot and those of you that want to capture that so that you know what that is. So if you can capture a screenshot, there's a snipping program on most computers. You can click on it and then draw your, draw your square over it with the plus sign and it'll give you that picture. And then when you put it on your, when you save it as a Word document, whatever you save it as, you can size it up or down. So you can certainly do eight inches of these four inches, whatever you want to do, depending on the size of blocks you have, and depending on the, the amount of time that you have. But I do mine out of five because this one was out of five. It's roughly about a five inch carving. 
a little shorter than that one, maybe four and a half, four and three quarter. And so mine's just a little bit bigger because I wanted a bigger head. As I said earlier, I don't really like carving real small faces. I, I do, I do some of them, but I really like having uh, this amount of face to add to mine and it makes it easier. Most important tool, as you've heard said many times, is a pencil. We're gonna use a pencil. And so I'm gonna grab a pencil that I know leaves marks. Actually, I'm gonna use a pen. My wife gets onto me because she says I, I, you can't see a, a pencil mark. And she may be right, because under this light, if I draw a pencil mark there, it doesn't show up very well. So I'm gonna do that because I wanna draw the center line. There's my center line, goes right between the legs, it goes up in the middle of the head. And that allows me to keep symmetry. And while not everything has to be symmetrical, because if you're if you're doing a carving that shows movement, movement on one side of the body doesn't necessarily translate into movement on the other side of the body. Another thing I'm going to go into go in here and do is to carve in some of the places where I know I'm going to make some marks. So here is the foot. This foot isn't going to be quite this big. I'm actually going to shorten it just a little bit. So I'm going to bring it up to about right there. And if the, the, the bottom of the breeches, bottom of the pants, I say breeches in the south where I come from, we call it breeches. For those who use it, get your breeches on. Pull your breeches up. Anyway, I'm going to connect those lines all the way across. It's, it's kind of hard to get in here in the middle of the legs until we really get into it, but we'll see what we can do. Somewhere here, I've got to decide where the headband's going to be. This is obviously going to be the nose. Somewhere up here is going to be the eyebrow. And so somewhere right here, I'm going to have a headband. It could be, I could, you can move it back, you can move it forward. It's entirely up to you. Actually, I think that that might be about right because when I do feathers like that, that looks about right. So I'm going to connect that across the top of the carving so that I can follow on one side of the face being larger than the other. And actually this goes back just a little bit. And so somewhere in here is going to be my feathered part of the headdress and then depend on how far back we come here with the feathers and then the skull cap in there. Now, if you decide to have the train on the back, that's entirely up to you. This is a, a one way of doing it. But you know it's flat plane. You know it was done quickly because they left a lot of the cutting marks here. And, and I don't, there's nobody on the bottom of this. There's no name on here. So I don't know who did this. Um, it might be from one of the famous families, although they usually sign it. And it might just be somebody who did one as a, as, as an example of those. But, but anyway, regardless of who did it, it didn't matter. I don't, I, I think I paid five or six dollars for this. It wasn't much. And, and that's true of most of the carvings that I bought. I don't pay much for carvings because I usually see them somewhere and I want to rescue them. And so we're going to, we've, I've rescued this and I've made a few more of my own. Another thing I want to come in here and do is where the, where the cloth is. And where the hand is and this is going to de determine on how big your hand is going to be because what you have to understand also is where this hole is right here for the rifle or whatever tool you put in there you've got to make it it can't be straight up because you can see when i go straight up i run into the shoes the moccasins so i got to angle that a little bit back and I've, it's very careful on how i do that because i've got to make sure that's around the shoe the other thing you could do is if you wanted to move everything over, have the hand there, move the feet over, and it's going to be a little bit harder, but I want to make sure that hand lines up right around where the feet are so that I can get a little bit of that hand. You know, if you'll notice, the hand sticks out farther than the feet. The feet stick up right here. Where I'm going to cut them off is right there, so it looks like I've got room to put that, put that rifle right in there. And I'd be straight in right around where the feet is. So those are the things you have to take into consideration. So that's what we want to start with. And so I'm going to, I'm going to come back with my marker and make those lines that may be a little bit harder to see. There's the front of the feet. There's the, the bottom of the breeches. Breeches. 
and then we've got the where the hands gonna be it's gonna fit right in here somewhere and where the blankets going to be it's gonna come all the way down to here and show that fold right there and then I'm not gonna worry so much about the face right now because I want to get most of what I want in there to start with now if you feel like you need to go ahead and draw some lines in for your feathers so you know where they go make sure you have the same number of lines here as you have over here are we one two three four five six one two six or seven one two three four five okay make sure you have the same number you don't want to do 13 feathers over here and that uh, wind up fine it's you got 11 feathers over here i'll go though i guess that's okay if you want to do that but anyway uh that's where we're going to be i don't know that i'm going to include the train here but i'm going to draw it in just in case i decide to because i don't know what that's going to look like because if the feathers lay back here then what do you do back here so all right I'm, i think i'm about ready to start so as always always we're going to start with safety features i don't carve unless i have safety features on and i'm always going to carve using safety features even with safety features, even with wearing a glove, you're still going to have a little poke. I was teaching a class the other night and I was carving a dog and I went to slide back along the tail and my knife went right in through a hole in my glove and it made a little nick in there. Not enough to worry about it, but for some reason it just wouldn't stop bleeding. It didn't hurt, but um, I got blood in a couple places and I just had to explain to the class that that happens and that's why we wear the gloves so that I didn't have stitches. I just had, a, I had a, something that I covered up with a band-aid and I was fine after that. All right, I'm gonna use a variety of tools. I don't behold to any one set of tools, although I really enjoy uh, Drake knives, uh, probably right up there with my, my number one or number two use of blades, but I don't like to get into that. I use a tool that does what I want it to do and it doesn't matter who makes it as long as it does what I want it to do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take out this part right here because where the hand is, all of this comes off. Now I can't go all the way back. I've gotta leave a little bit, but I can go back, I can go back part ways, but I wanna take a good portion of this stuff off. And so that's the first thing I'm gonna do. Safety features, I'm using a V-tool. This is my Drake V-tool. It's a wide one, I really enjoy it. And it does exactly what I want it to do. And I'm just going to carve right up that line that I first made for the hand. Just straight up. Takes off a lot. You know, it's like, this is, carving's like painting. If you can use a big tool as long as you can, then you can take off a lot more wood. I'm going to come in here with a Drake fishtail. I'm going to go straight into that. I want to carve straight into that hole that I cut. And then I just want to come start taking some of that off. Whether you carve with the grain or against the grain, it still, it works either way. That was against the grain. Here's with the grain, it does either way. Just know how much you're taking off and understand that if you're doing this for the first time, you do not have to take off as much as you see somebody doing it that's demonstrating it to you. Obviously, hopefully, they've done more than you have at this point. And so they know exactly how much wood they can take off. And so they do so quicker than you probably do. Don't try to keep up with them. I've done that a few times where I took a class and I tried to keep up with the instructor. And, you know, some of them will tell you, just watch for a little bit. Especially if you're in a class, they'll come around and show you. With the advent of online and Zoom classes, it's a little bit more difficult to be able to follow because you can't see very well. As you can see from, I'm going to switch to a knife because that's getting awkward to get in there. As you can see from watching videos, for those of you that have been watching videos for a while, sometimes it's hard to see. We, we as instructors, we get focused on the teaching and forget sometimes that we get off camera and forget that we sometimes get um, a little bit sideways or we're covering up what we're doing. All I'm doing right now is removing this wood so that I can shape that hand. And figure out where that's going to go. Okay, roughing out what I need. I've got the hand space cut out there. 
I will have to come in here and figure out exactly where that hand's going to go, but I'm not going to do that just yet. Okay, I know where that's going to go. So look at where that hand goes. I've got I've got a big hand because when you when you drill into here, if you don't have a big hand and you've got a small hand, it's so easy to drill through the hand itself. I want to work on these legs. And all I want to do primarily right off the bat is just shape them. So if you know the shape of a foot, it's generally wider at the front where the toes are than it is at the back. And so you've got to take into consideration. So if you don't feel comfortable with, with just cutting, go ahead and draw your shoe in. Draw the middle of the shoe, draw the back, especially if you're gonna, if you're gonna make it wider. So I want this to be the widest part, although I've cut them pretty narrow because this is, I don't want the focus to be on the feet. I want the focus to be on the face, the hand, and the, and the, the blanket that they're wearing. I've made this one a little bit narrower. That's okay, I can narrow them up. So you can see how much I'm gonna take off the back of the feet. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and lop that off. Don't need to take off a whole lot because I'm just gonna try to shape them up and match. Same way with the front. Be careful as you're carving because sometimes these have a tendency to break off. You've got a long piece of wood sticking out there and the grain's running this way. It can make it difficult to get where you need to go. But if you just take your time, I don't think any of us are in a, mar in a, in a, in a race to do this. We're in a marathon, so let's get it done. I've shaped one foot. I'll move the foot, the, the leg back so it doesn't look and I'll look odd and then I'll narrow down the foot. So I'm just shaping down these feet, make sure they're both the same size in terms of length. Understand that you could turn one of these sideways. You can do a number of things you want with these, but I want you to just enjoy this project because it is a, a flat plane example for those of you that haven't done flat plane, and it's a Native American. So one of the one of the best Native American carvers I've seen lately, uh, Lynn Dowdy. If you ever get a chance to watch his videos, see his work, it's really interesting to watch. I'm going to slope in the back, the back of the leg. So I'm just going to take some wood off that way and I, when I'm going this way I'm okay but when I'm going this way it wants to split so I got to be real careful how I do that and make sure I'm not splitting off stuff I want to keep but I'm just trying to give it some shape so that it doesn't look like a straight up straight down leg sticking out see how that shape has a little bit to it we'll thin it down a little bit more because we're going to aim those legs in almost like he's not standing straight up he's kind of like leaning forward a little bit. Whatever we do to one side, we want to do it to the other as well. So right now, primarily, I'm just shaping it and removing that, those saw marks. Nobody likes saw marks, do we? Because, you know, on a carving, look here. On this carving, they've left the saw marks there. To me, that's a matter of just having a little more respect for what you're doing and cutting off those, those carving marks, those saw marks. I don't like them any more than you do. So you see them right there. And so I do everything I can to remove those lines because um, it, for those of us, for those of you that decide to put your carving in a show, in a competition, that is a big no-no. They'll let it go for beginners, but as, a, as an instructor and as a, as a judge, I've judged a few shows too, you want to make sure that the carving is finished and nothing says unfinished carving or one that somebody did in a hurry than one that has saw marks on them. So if you, if you want to do anything else, if you do nothing else to clean up your carving, get all the saw marks off that you can because that just sends a message that I'm not really done with it, but you know, here, tell me what you think. And I don't know about you, but I don't like criticism, so everything I can do, especially if I'm go if I'm putting my stuff out there for 
judging, the best thing I can do is make the best product I can. I teach high school and a few years back we I did a project and the the digital people, the digital storytellers of our video of our district decided they wanted to record that lesson. And it was basically um, the crux of the lesson was if you didn't do the best job you can, why are you turning it in? If you can do better, why not take the time to do better? And I've, and I've tried to follow that philosophy. Not that I'm perfect, but I'm going to piddle around with it until I think it's about as perfect as I can make it. You take some other professional that could come in and really make it perfect, even more perfect than I think I could do, and that's great. I'm not trying to compete with anybody, except when I'm doing it a show, and so in that case, I want to make it as clean as I can. So you can tell all I'm doing is shaping these legs, just trying to thin them down a little bit because I don't like them too thin, but I also don't want them looking goofy too. I don't want them looking so goofy that I can't justify what I've done. In other words, I want to make sure that those legs look like real legs and don't look like you know something just sticks sticking out of a out of a carving so i'm going to continue to, to thin those down i'm certainly not done with them because i haven't done the shoes but at least i know where i'm at and so i've cut off my lines i want to draw them back on for the breeches breeches there's just some words you just enjoy saying don't you breeches is one of them i just think it's funny Tell my kids, don't get up, don't don't uh, don't get above your britches. Don't get out of your britches. All right, let's cut in those lines there. I'm gonna take a smaller V tool. I've got a larger V tool out here. I'm gonna take another Drake V tool, and I just want to cut those lines in. Make sure your your tools are sharp when you do this, because you're going across grain, and you don't have a lot of wood here to work with. So you want to make sure that you're preserving as much wood as you can because these are just the, the pants the buckskin pants that the Native Americans would wear and so all I'm going to do is outline them right now because I'm going to go and I'm going to make them a little more separated as we go along I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to make them perfect but I want to make sure that I've got what I want and it's hard to get in there to make that line, so leave that until you've, until you've done a little bit more trimming. So going back in there, I want to go right into that groove that I cut. And because I want the pants to overlap the shoes, I'm going to, I'm going to make that cut up to the pants. And I just want to take that wood off. It shapes that pant a little bit more. It shapes that foot. Okay. On the back, be careful because it's really easy to split off. And I can tell you how I know that, but uh, we'll just have fun doing it. I just want to trim off the moxin uh, underneath the foot, underneath the leg, sorry. And then take off that really sharp edge there as well. Like I said, the back is narrower than the, foot, than the front, so I'm going to trim a little bit back here. And I'm just going to round that foot out, the back of it. A little bit later, I'll come back. Well, let's go ahead and do that now while I'm talking about it. I want to curl that up to the leg. It's part of that flat plane. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is a, is a modified flat, flat plane. We're not going to have these great big cutouts like some of our my friends do. Um, I just want to keep this real simple. I don't want to be too crazy about it. Okay, do it for both, both shoes. Oh, stop cutting there, otherwise they won't come out of there very easily. I'm using a knife from Pinewood Forge. I like it because it's stiff and short. And it's easy for me to make quick carvings with the flat plane. I've got, they make a, this is the Harley knife. They make this one and they make a larger one as well. I think this one is inch and a half and this one is two inches and so they're very stiff blades but they have a they're rounded on the back so they roll as well so when you want to 
when you want to do that rolling cut where you're carving and you're curling your hand, these work really well because they don't flex a lot, but they flex enough while still retaining their their shape. So Dell Studs at Pinewood Forge does a really good job at making these blades, and I've really enjoyed. I've had four of them. I, I got I got these two. I bought directly from them, and then I bought a. I bought a pair of them from an estate sale in North Dakota. A friend of mine was out there and he sent me a picture and said, would you like these? I did. I turned around and I sold them to somebody who wanted them. I sold them for what I had into them because I, I do that a lot when I find tools. I buy them for whatever that is and sell them to, for whatever I pay for them just to put them in the hands of somebody who needs them. A friend of mine needed some Helvies that I wasn't using. I sold them to them for a lot less than what I paid for them because they had wear to them. Anyway, I, uh, I, I really enjoy putting carving tools in the hands of those who are really going to use them because, you know, this is all about helping. I've been a teacher a good portion of my life and I really enjoy it. Um, and it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching outdoor skills with scouting or if I'm teaching science in class or if I'm teaching carving in a, in, in a carving class. I really, really enjoy the teaching part of it. It's, I, I believe that's might be my best calling is being able to pass on what I've learned to somebody else. Okay, we got the legs sort of. Got a few little boogers hanging around in there. We'll get those out of there. Got our legs sort of shaped out. I want to shape the feet. Now, the problem I run into shaping the feet this early is if it's if they're too small, they're going to be fragile. What I'm going to do. I want that shoe to be about this thick, but I also want it to be rounded too. I don't want them to be flat land lover shoes. So I'm gonna go straight in to that cut that I made. Let me draw that on there with my black marker because you may not be able to see that out there in Cyberland. And I wanna make sure if I'm teaching you, you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna carve straight back at an angle. Careful not to crash into those, those breaches breaches <laughs> into those breaches too much isn't that, a, isn't that a cool word breaches i mean i'm not sure what the origin of that is breaches but i'm sure it's some english word that we americans have shortened it down to fit us but i'm just making that that shoe a little thinner It, do it to one shoe, then I'm going to do it to the other. This is some wood I got from our local woodcraft store. We bought it a couple years ago. A guy came through and was selling wood, and he brought a whole truckload of it. And I think I bought, I think I bought half the truckload, and I'm almost out. So I am. I just ordered some from Heineke, and boy, you talk about some good wood out there. That's just some. Tim does a really good job at providing the wood that you need and the kind that you need and the, it's just good stuff. And so this is part of that stuff that I got for originally from the gentleman that came through our town and sold them to the local wood store. Got to be careful with wood because it, it, I always say life is too short to carve bad wood and I, and I firmly believe that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that. I've got uh, issues with my hands sometimes depending on how hard I work them and so I'm going to be real careful as I get older to protect them because you only get one set of hands and I want to make sure that they last long enough for me to do what I want to do in carving. Okay we got the shoes carved out roughly. Oh, there's got a little bit more we're going to do to them after that. So now what I want to do is I'm going to, I want to round the body a little bit. If this is where my feathers are going to come, I don't want to cut off above that because I'm going to have feathers coming out here like this and they're going to come out to the outside of that. And so I want to cut up to this body. I want to cut up this one. I want to cut up this one because I want to round. I want to round here, get a little bit of that sharp edge off. Let me show you one of mine. Quit showing you somebody somebody else's. Mine, we want to round this and leave this hump here for the arm. There's an arm tucked under there holding the holding the, the blanket together. 
So I want to leave that there, but I want to round that into the head. I'm going to round that into the head so I have room for the feathers to come here. This trail that I left here, train I guess, is more evocative of a fur coming out of here. But I just want to, I want to round that, I want to round this, I want to round a little bit of that. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to do that. And I just want to take those corners off. Ooh, big knife. So whatever whatever wood removing tool you use to get some of those down, to get some of the shapes down. I'm still leaving enough to get I get an arm out of there. But I'm gonna come in here and I wanna don't want to take much off here because if I look here, I don't want to remove much of that corner right there. There's not much of it that I want that I, I want to save it. I want to preserve that. But I'm also gonna go above the head and do it as well. Above the arm, so and in the back as well. I've done a few of these so I can go a little faster than maybe you do because I know where I'm going and I know where I want to be. Sorry, I'm way off the camera. Pardon me. I'm just rounding this head here. On, or not the head. Sorry, rounding the shoulder. And just trying to get some kind of shape to the overall carving so that I can see it. And I'm finding out that a lot of people, if they don't see the shape, and it's hard for them to get where they need to go, because it's, if you can't see it, you can't draw it, and you can't draw it, you can't carve it. So it makes it difficult for us to be able to, to get to that point. Now, at this point, I'm going to draw this edge here of the blanket right here. And I've got that right here. I'm going to make it a little bit thicker than I originally did. And there's the hand. And so roughly my hand's going to be, it's going to fill up a good portion of the spot because I want him to have a big hand. I don't want it to have a tiny little hand and, and it did not look like it's holding anything. And so if you'll notice right here, let me get a pointer here. If you'll notice right here, there's a separation between the hand in the blanket that's going to be right here. So I'm going to take that and actually if you look back we've got the hand sticking way out. We don't want it sticking out that far because we've got to leave room for the blanket as well. And so we're just going to we're going to cut this in right here. And we're going to cut that well we're going to leave that leave that alone for right now. We're going to cut this in. I'm just going to take a smaller size V tool and I'm just going to go straight up. And then I'm going to go back in there with my fishtail gouge and remove some of that so I embed that hand behind the blanket. Don't cut it back too far because you still got to leave room to be able to get past that shoe. So if you see that shoe doesn't come out past the hand. And so that's where I want that to be. And so now I'm just going to trim off this blanket here, that corner anyway. We're going to move it back because this blanket comes all the way down here. And it comes all the way back into this back into this part of the blanket as well. And so we'll remo we'll remove some more of that as we talk. And then I'm going to take this harsh edge off right here because I don't want it. I'm going to curl that. I talked about that curling. Watch how my hand curls so that I can make that curling cut right up into that. It looks like that blanket curls right there. Okay. I'm going to take off. I know the hand isn't going to be that big. And so what I want to do is remove the part of the hand that doesn't need to be there. That part right there. And I'm, I'm always cautious, so I'm going to say that's where I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut outside of those lines. So again, deepen that separation between the blanket and the hand. Turn it around before I split that wood. Come on, let's do it with a knife. Now 
and then I'm going to round that piece right there. I apologize, I'm using a new camera setup. If I get off the camera a lot, I apologize. I'll try to edit some of that out in the, in the post editing when I'm done. Okay. And here's the other thing I want to remember as well. Where this is, is right here. So the blanket comes down here as well. And so we're going to remove some of this out here while we're leaving the arm roughly right in there. Okay. So let's, I know, I know the hand's going to be smaller, so let's go ahead and trim that out. Okay. Let's use a short knife. I'm just going to come in. Stop cut, trim it up. Stop cut, and just keep going out that way. Be careful not to split that hand off. A lot of different ways to do this, but for those of you that only have a knife or maybe only have a couple tools, this is one way of doing it too. I could certainly come in here with my fishtail gouge and make that stop cut in there and then come up to it, chip off a lot of that. Be careful not to pry, do as I say, but don't do as I sometimes do. Anyway, we're just we're we're just gonna trim that off. And just make that hand shape all right in there. Okay. Do it to the top as well. Stop cut. Like I say, I really enjoy the teaching part of it. I've been carving now for a while, and I've had an opportunity to do a lot of teaching, and I, and I think it's been a lot of fun. In fact, I know it's been a lot of fun because I enjoy it. I get an opportunity here in Boise, my hometown, or the town I live in, to, to teach not only for um, our local wood store, Woodcraft, but I also teach through the Boise School District Community Ed classes. And I've recently begun starting to teach a homeschool group that comes over um, occasionally and takes a class from me. And I, I really enjoy the teaching part of what we're doing. There's just something about giving back and there's something about the necessity of having somebody who's done a few of these show somebody else how to do it and that's the part for me that I really enjoy is being able to give back and I've been teaching something since I was 19 years old when I first went to service I ended up working at the local rec center at the base I was stationed at and I taught then I did my military service and I was a scout leader at the time taught then after then I went back to school and now I teach science and I still teach and I, I just enjoy being able to I'm gonna grab a tool that allow me to get in there it's getting a little bit crowded in here I just enjoy the opportunity to get back and that's that's been for me what is the most important thing about what I'm doing all right we're at uh, 49 minutes it's hard to upload anything longer than an hour so I'll end this video here in just a little bit but let me let me let me make this cut right here and I'm going to draw it on the bottom as well so I take my v-tool I want a big one and I just want to cut right up there make a deep groove in there a couple times and this is where this blank is going to come out go in there with a stop cut on the, that side of the robe and on this side 
and then I'm just going to come in here with my fishtail gouge. And what I want to do is start deepening that. I just want to deepen that so it looks like the blanket is tucked back under that arm. Again, I don't want to get too crazy on this because I definitely want to leave some room for everything else that I want to put in here. And so I can't just go hog wild on removing everything, but I do know where some of these things can come off. So that's what I want. Looks like looks like that blanket's coming out from behind. This flap is coming out over that one. The other thing I'll do before we leave is let's decide right there is where the arm is going to be. So we need to shape that. So I'm going to shape that down. See how that jumps right out of there? Do it on this side as well. Well that corner of that wood is good as it? a little brown color to it. Okay and then above it I want to indent as well. Sorry. So it looked like that arm stuck out there. All right. And I think we're going to call this one good. And I'll download this one and put it on the computer and then we'll do the editing and then I'll do the other one. So I'm going to end right there. We're, we're not quite halfway. We've got the legs done. We're working on the hand. We're going to work on, we don't have much to do to the blanket, but we got to make some decisions between now and, and when we come back, what we're going to do here and what that's going to be and then what, what your face is going to look like. Because you can certainly have smiling, scowling, happy, fierce, whatever, whatever facial expression or neutral, whatever facial expression you decide to do this, we want to make sure you have, you have an opportunity to do that. So. I'll talk to you in a little bit in the next video. This is part one. We'll do part two here in just a little bit. Thanks for joining us.